Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a special, special edition of ASAP Cafe. I'm really humbled because this is our 50th show this very day. 50 ASAP Cafes. <laughs> That's a lot of shows. And so, on my immediate left here, we have the Honorable Mayor John Ingen, who is our guest for this special edition of ASAP Cafe today. And of course, Linda Brooks Curtis. She's one of our regulars that's been with us, and we have all the food here. Uh, Patty's not able to be with us today, and our mascot, Pee Wee, unfortunately, is not going to be able to be here today. And of course, we have another special guest, <laughs> Louise Bundy. And uh, she is the hostess of the new Lawrence Welk show that I'm doing. And um, we'll talk about that. So let's start off this edition here with uh, the traditional this guy's in love with you. Oh, this piano here. It's such a cool song, I like this song. And if you know the words, have, you know, sing along if you want. <laughs> song mm -hmm. Lovely. Lovely. yeah yes. thank you sir well these are just piano classical versions of these popular songs and like I've told people in the past um, I trained for a whole year to be able to do that to take any um, popular song and make it sound classical the late Marshall Coswell was my piano teacher at the time and he trained me for a whole year to be able to do that you know showing me these tricks and stuff they're based on what's called chords and scales you know when you're doing a little runs and so on and it kind of gives it a little classical flavor instead of the traditional way of playing popular music. So <laughs> that's how I learned how to do that. And um, I'll give another example. Uh, I'm going to give you a Secret Agent Man. Are you familiar with that? I am. I'll give you my version of that song. something like that <laughs> and that's not a song you hear every day on the piano no, you don't. so um, I have to thank Mr. Coswell he's the one that showed me how to do all those tricks and take any popular song and just make it sound that way because the traditional way would be something like this you know something like that when you're like in a hotel or something yeah so <laughs> The business card of Tom and Judy Dempsey, the accordionists, 
Okay, that well. I thought you might be interested in, but I gave you the information. I'll just have to check that. I haven't been around the They're computer a lot lately. They can play anything. Okay, so they, they'll be expecting me to just contact them then? Uh, well, that's what I told them. Okay, I'll do I, that. I figured you would want to contact them, but I figured you really need an, an accordion or two on Mm -hmm. take off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Need, uh, Definitely. yeah. A little champagne amuse. <laughs> well, I have just about everything I I have just about oh. everything I need. Um the university gave me the ballroom and they gave me permission to put up the chandeliers and build two sets in there. Wow. So I've gotten that far and uh, we'll have a big band in there too. So that's gonna you be a lot of fun. Building the sets? Yeah, I have to pay these folks though too, you know. Well, they're not gonna be making like seventy an hour or something like that, but you know, they, they gave me that PBS budget, which I had sent yeah. you, so that's included. And uh, of course, I had the support of this MCAT studio here. They're going to help put that thing together. So all the pieces are there. <laughs> now I just got to just get, get the, get the funding. <laughs> it's always a hill to climb. Oh. Yeah, no kidding. I've been hitting that pavement, and I've been, you know, networking like crazy. What's the candelabra worth? You think Bond Shop would take that? <laughs> Uh, probably not. Actually, this candelabra is 100 years old for real. Really? Yeah, it was donated. Um, Robin Elaine Dent, the young woman that sang on the Lawrence Welk show that yeah. we did, she donated this candelabra. And it's literally 100 years old. It's, it's had some restoration done to it, obviously. And there's still some, well, you probably won't see it on camera. There's like some little wax issues and scratch issues and things. Well, Gives makes, it some character. Makes a lot of miles. You get around with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I like about this particular candelabra is um, if you look at this here, it looks like a musical note, uh, uh, the treble clef on the staff, oh, yeah. instead of the traditional round base candelabras. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are actual beeswax candles. The They're tapers right. are ready to go at any time. <laughs> <laughs> the lights go out in here, we're prepared for oh. the Yes, sir, and we just it's, light that up. a double purpose. That's, you're always thinking of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, anyway, uh -huh. well, you know, I, I'm really humbled because I think this community has been very good to me over the years and people like Luis and of course yourself and Linda and people have been supportive uh, trying to help me to launch off some of these crazy projects I get myself into. <laughs> but I think people will respond to it well. I really do. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I mean, they're tired of inane things. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, I don't know if you know this, I got an email from the Lawrence Welk Network, the OET Network. They contacted me twice, and they said that once this show gets on PBS, they're going to try to find a national sponsor. Oh, fantastic. But the thing is, we got to get it on the air exactly. before they can do anything, so that's what I've been dealing with. Gotcha. That's what I've been dealing with here. So, Linda, how have you been lately? It's been a few weeks since I've seen you. Well, I helped with Missoula Marathon. Oh, excellent. How did that go? Well, um, my main vantage point was the last um, relief point before the end of the race. Uh huh. And um, the First Presbyterian Church had a brass band and oh. a lot of things there. And we really had fun offering oh, people great. cool, clear water. <laughs> so that was exciting. Uh, last weekend, and spent three days there with wedding festivities and getting acquainted and reacquainted with family members. My nephew and his, and my nephew uh, got married. And what's funny is my brother's name is Dan and my nephew's name is Dan and my name is Linda and the bride's name is Linda. <laughs> there could have been some confusion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I, that's not much of a secret anymore. That's out of the bag. What are your ratings, ASAP? Do you know? Ratings even for this show? Yeah. It's hard to know. Um, I want to know how many people now know Linda's secret about TV and Toto. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. The larger question will Patty know. She's yeah. gonna know when she sees this yeah. show. <laughs> well, that's good. You'd be surprised how many people watch this show. I'm surprised. How I many had a guest watch on City Council. Yeah, I had a guest on. Um, her name is Jeannie Laughlin. She was on here about a month ago, and she said she was at the bus stop one day, and this guy, total stranger, just drove right up to her and said, "Hey, I saw you on that ASAP Cafe." <laughs> And I've gotten that a few times too. I've walked into like stores and people say, "Hey, I saw you on that cafe show." You're a launching pad for television careers. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a good way to look at it. Huh? <laughs> it's really humbling, though. But um, yeah, and, and also a guy walked up to me one day, um, said the same thing. He'd seen me on the cafe. Yeah. You play pretty good there, <laughs> older guy. So <laughs> I just said thank you, sir. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I guess this is practice for when we do this Lawrence Welk show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what, hmm? like you said, what is nice about it is it's generating goodwill because it's helping other people to achieve their performing dreams. Yeah, and, and that's another reason why I created this show. I, you know, there's been a few people that have never really got to follow their dreams in life. So, appearing on this cafe, it's a small way of letting them do that. It's fantastic. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's a very tiny way of letting them do that. Oh, that's great. So, if you want to recite Casey at the Bat, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Here's a perfect song for Mayor John. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you remember that song, don't you? <laughs> yeah, the the Farina Cat Chow Meow commercial. Mix. Meow Mix. The Meow Mix. Yeah. yeah. Close. Okay. Well, Farina. Have you ever done any singing? Uh, after a fashion, yeah, I sing. I sing best alone and in silence. <laughs> well, you have a nice resonance. Yeah. Thank you. I don't want to put you on the spot, so you're working to belt out a half of a tune if you want. <laughs> yeah, about, about half is what you want. <laughs> I do a lot of Bruce Springsteen in the car. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, with the windows up. It seems to be the best way to go. Santa Lucia. Isn't that a pretty song? I always think of Jim Neighbors, the actor, every oh, time right. I hear that song. Did you ever see the clip with him on the Andy Griffith show, singing that? Yes. Yes, yeah, always had that remarkable voice despite mm -hmm. his... Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. He'd be like, hey, Sergeant Carter, you know, <laughs> talking like that, and then sound with that baritone voice. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where did that guy get that <laughs> voice from? <laughs> yeah. Well, it kind of gives you some insight into uh, the way that Yeah. And for him to do something that was beneath his dignity for that character, you know, to be appealing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my understanding of his career, the, the Marines made him an honorary Marine in real life yeah. for playing that character. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, well, I know Gomer Powell like, couldn't do Kung Fu and stuff like that, but he always stood for right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really watch that show. Yeah, yeah. it's really honest. And yeah, and citizen. so yeah. my that's understanding when I checked out his career, that's what yeah. they said about him, that the Marines actually gave him a title that's good. as a Marine, honorary Marine. And he did a lot of concerts over the years, too, with the mm -hmm. uh, United States Marine Corps band. Oh, nice. Yeah, they've got some of those concerts posted throughout his career on, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's on YouTube now, they've got oh, some of that yeah. posted. Yeah, they're an amazing band. Yeah. And uh, speaking of amazing military bands, I once saw the... Um, 561st, I think that was the name of it. I mean, I'm sorry, 561st Air Force Band. Oh. They were backing Doc Severance oh, wow. at the um, Sacramento 
State Fair. Oh my goodness. They put on two shows. I went to wow. both shows. <laughs> <laughs> really? And uh, Ed McMahon was there too, mm -hmm. and that was so cool. It's just like watching the Tonight Show. Yeah, I bet. But that only was cars when you were a trumpet player, right? Yeah, during my trumpet years. Yeah. This was so many years ago. <laughs> and uh, I went to both shows. I knew how to play the piano all along too, like I mentioned. And uh, Doc Severson did not disappoint. I bet. He's pretty amazing. Is he, he, still, is he still living? Yes, sir. He's in his 80s. He, he and his wife moved to Mexico, is what they said. So he's doing some concerts with uh, Arturo Sandoval every once in a while. Oh. He comes out of retirement, nice. I guess. Yeah. And I guess that's a good place to retire. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, Mexico. <laughs> Especially in February. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you sing? Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. You don't hear me sing. Louise is an accomplished I've seen Louise dance. She's remarkable. Thank you. Yeah, you had a studio. You still um, have a did. studio in California? I had a studio for 10 years. And then I taught for 22 years in LA. And I taught not only ballet, but tap, jazz, folklorical, mm -hmm. international folk dancing. Yeah. So, so <laughs> to see her come out when we did that Lawrence Welk show, that pilot, that was way cool. You know, I didn't. I don't know if I ever told you. It took everything in me to keep from stopping when I saw you out of court of my coming out there on your tippy toes. People toes. When you were yep. on your when you were on your toes, my feet still hurt. It's amazing. I had to literally zone her out of the court of my eye, and I had to say to myself, ASAP, keep playing because. You know, she might not be able to keep doing this, <laughs> keep playing, so. Yeah, it had been a long time since I'd done any point work at all. Almost, well, 13 years. Really? Since I've been, yeah. So I left my studio in 2001, and that's the last time I danced. So had you, had you warmed up to do that? A little. Yeah. Yeah, I would practice a little bit at home, and yeah. I warmed up outside before I came in, actually. So did toe shoes provide you some degree of support? Yes, there's okay. a box. Okay. It's actually structured of layers of fabric and paste. Okay. And the ones that I have, luckily, are lined with flannel on the inside. The old ones weren't. You had to wear lamps all around your toes or something to protect your toes. I just wear a little thin uh, foam pad right now. So, but they're really nice shoes. Expensive, but nice. I noticed that your feet are pretty highly arched. Uh, yeah, I love high heel shoes too. <laughs> uh, I've always had difficulty finding shoes that really fit because really? my arches are so high. Oh. Sure. Absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. So, yeah. And it takes work. I mean, when dancers always stretch their feet. I would stick my toes under the bottom of the couch and then straighten my legs so it would stretch my arches, you know, and keep them strong and supple. But, you know, once dance is in your blood, <laughs> I mean, I'm still on a dancer's diet and I don't dance anymore, so. I imagine Yes, I had a couple, one that went to New York and danced in Germany for a while, and another uh, good tap dancer that uh, was in the Chicago, I believe, so. And I taught for so long that kids were bringing me their kids after. <laughs> That's way cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was nice. really glad to have you be part of that show, and yep. this, for the sake of the audience, if they don't know, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the show we're talking about. Last September, Mayor John and Luis and myself and host of other guests, we actually shot this television pilot called Music with ASAP, and the premise, it's a remake, an update of the Lawrence Welk show, and then it was submitted to the Lawrence Welk Network at the time, and it was submitted to PBS, and they picked it up in December, so hopefully we'll be able to do this weekly once we get this funding started, so this is it, Lauren, uh, um, Music with ASAP, you can see it on YouTube, or just call the MCAT studio and uh, order a copy, so. Anyway, <laughs> it was fun doing that show. It was. It was a lot of fun. I, I did a lot of door opening. That was sort of my strong <laughs> suit. I would open the door. Yes, sir. And I would close it. And that was, we kept with my skill set. Well, you know, you were a good sport for doing that, uh, especially being the mayor. So that, that's like way cool. You know, you, you know your limits and you stick to them. And that's always been my. Yeah, like that Clint Eastwood movie. A man's got to lower his limitations. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. <laughs> well, I imagine um, the good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> good, the bad, and the ugly, indeed. Yeah. Go ahead. You are well aware of all the talent 
Well, it's a pretty, pretty amazing city. We have remarkably talented people. We have fine artists, performing artists, um, great athletes. It's really, it's pretty amazing. That's what I like about living here in Missoula, um, the, the diversity in a sense, yeah. especially musically I'm talking now. Um, I'm talking more musically than racially, but um, yeah, there's diversity racially too, but I like the uh, arts here in this city. And the free concerts. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I lived in Billings for 12 years, and I did a lot of piano playing there. And I was always advised to consider Missoula at that time. And so, um, in 2008, I made the decision to come here. And it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad no one's advised me to consider Billings. That's <laughs> probably not a good thing to have that yeah. when you're mayor. But, <laughs> well, I um, guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you... Are you well, why were they advising you to consider Missoula? Ace well, Abbott? because uh, they thought I'd have more opportunities. Let's see, there you go. That's, here. that's all I needed thought, to hear. I yeah. just wanted to make sure you weren't and being run out on a rail. No, 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 sir. I, did, I, I didn't, don't know about I that. didn't break any laws. Right, good, good. <laughs> Maybe too much piano playing. Yeah. No, but really, I played at the um, Northern Hotel seven months. I played at O'Hara's Restaurant for five months. I played at the uh, Yellowstone Art Museum for five months. And it was another art museum that they hired me on occasion to do some stuff. And I also played at the uh, Deaconess Hospital for almost a year. Well, it's, I think it's called the Billings Clinic now, but it was Deaconess at that time. And all they had me do was go into the, the cafeteria section of the hospital and just play that grand piano in there while there was all those people shoved up in there having lunch at the That's hospital. Lovely, yeah. And then, of course, the sound resonated up on the second floor, so it people that were sense. sick could hear the music. It's a very pleasant environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I got to do that for about a year. And just a lot of other local community events at that time. And my name appeared in the media 25 times in 12 years. So, <laughs> so how much do you play every day? Well, I haven't been able to practice as much as I should because I don't have a piano at home at the moment. But I usually try to get about four to five hours a day. And I don't do it in one setting. It's throughout the course of day. Like, what I do is I'll put a movie on, like my big fat Greek wedding which of course is my favorite movie. <laughs> and you turn it down really low, and you just do some scales while you're, um, you know, throughout the duration of that film. And then by the time the movie's over, you got two hours practice in. Because see, what you do is you, when I practice, the way I practice is not the way I perform. So when you're practicing, you might do something like, let's say the Chopin's Minute Waltz, you'll do something like this. See, very slow, see? And you can just do that over and over. Something like this, see? And you can stop on that note there and just do that over and over. And you can do the middle part like, um, really slow, see? Something like this, see? And see how nice that sounds at that speed? Mm -hmm. So you can practice all your Chopin pieces in slow motion and give your brain time to process everything. And, and that's how I practice. So by the time that movie's over, I have two hours of practicing maybe the same run on the minute waltz, mm -hmm. for example. So do you have, actually have a keyboard? No, I have to go to the university sometimes to practice, and I don't get much time to practice. You know you could come over to Missoula Manor, and I have a 100-year-old piano in my room, and it sounds wonderful. I may take you up on that. I did not know that. And there and are three pianos anybody can play okay. virtually any time in record. All right, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. I did not know four that. people. Wow. Okay. So, so yeah, any of those songs you could do in slow motion, even and, if you're and you not just a senior, you're welcome. Okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. And then you take a break, and you come back maybe an hour or two later, and you might do another set. It doesn't have to be literally two hours, but whatever. And you just keep doing that throughout the course of the day till you go to bed, and that's how you do it. Have you have you been uh, playing any of the downtown pianos? Not as much as I did last year. Well, because a lot of my time's been at the Missoula Senior Center playing there, so. I haven't had as much time, but yeah, I've played a few of those pianos downtown. They're fun. The, the, the one that they have some film footage to is the, uh, the one over there at the Hunter Bay. <coughs> they moved it over to that wall, that brick wall this year. So that's a pretty good spot. I like it. Now my favorite piano, I think, if I had to choose, would be the Starving Artist Cafe. Yeah. I've been out there a couple times too. Where's that? Uh, over there on Reserve. They have a... Um, outdoor light cafe with tables there and the pianos out there so it's comfortable there so when people are there eating lunch 
they have this big umbrella that they put underneath, under or over me to keep the sun out. Okay. Nice. And uh, they're good to me there at yeah. Starving Artist Cafe. Okay. That and the uh, Missoula Downtown Association, they're the ones, from my understanding, that set that up this year too. Mm -hmm. So that's my favorite panel because it's more comfortable. Yeah. The other ones are like right out of the sun. <laughs> the sun's like baking on your head and it's like 100 degrees out. You're like, oh, dear Lord, yeah, help. The, the ones on Higgins pretty much are exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's not exactly fun. Not I burned my finger uh, <laughs> temporarily okay. too on a hot key. I touched a note and it went, <laughs> ooh, I can oh. feel it. And I kept running water on it, and the pain just wouldn't go away. And I just kept running water, and it finally left. Yeah. So you're suffering for your art. <laughs> yes, sir. I think yes. so. Suffering for the city. <laughs> I think I'll do okay. Twilight. Let's have a little fun. I'm gonna play a song. Tell me if you know this one. Yeah, I used to watch Mighty Mouse when I was a kid. <laughs> Mighty Mouse will save the day. Yes. yes. He always did. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever see the uh, comedian Andy Kaufman's version of Mighty Mouse? No. Well, <laughs> I saw a lot of Andy Kaufman. I didn't see that. Well, it was kind of cheesy, but that's oh. what made it funny. Um, well, he was a mouse, so I imagine. He <laughs> yeah, he, part I of think it. He, he did the skit on Saturday Night Live, if I remember that correctly, and uh, they had this tiny old fashioned phonograph. And so they put the record on, and it was the theme song to Mighty Mouse. Oh, and he mouthed And he just, no, he just stood there like this while the music was playing. And every time we got to the part, here I come to save the day, he would go like this. Here I come to save the day. <laughs> it, was, it was so silly, you just couldn't help but laugh. It sounds like Andy Kong. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, yeah, that was a little Mighty Mouse skit, so. <laughs> but other than Andy Kaufman, yeah, I used to watch Mighty Mouse as a kid growing up, so. <laughs> yeah, TV was my babysitter, so I watched a lot yeah, of that, Yeah, too. <laughs> Well, of course, you might want to uh, consider including a nice, wholesome comic like that for your show. I thought about that. You know, on the documentary of Lawrence Welk, he didn't want any comedians on his show at that time because he just wanted to focus on the music. But I think it would be good to uh, put a comedian on there just to give it some differences. Because I don't want this show to be exactly like the Lawrence Welk show. I don't think it would work. Mm. That's why we're doing more modern music on that show as you know and stuff like that speaking of modern modern music let's have fun <laughs> yeah i'll do a little excerpt here my version of uh, painted black i knew it was coming yeah all those young <laughs> folks love that song Classical version of that song. It's a mix in his 70s, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I always tell Those people. Yoga, he's in great shape. Yeah, yeah I, always, I always make fun. This is in a fun way. He should keep his t shirt on when he's bouncing around on stage yeah. these days now. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I guess we got the number we one rock band in the world. It doesn't matter. We all should do yeah. I used to 
start my, my college speech classes with a, a 10 minute yoga and breathing mm. and speaking mm -hmm. routine mm -hmm. to warm everybody up. Oh, yeah. So they, they count on it to make them feel more alert. Definitely. And speak Definitely. Yeah, all ballet dancers before a show do a full ballet bar, which takes about 35, 45 minutes yeah. before they perform. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The bumblebee in slow motion, see? Oh. You know, you do that about a zillion times, you'll get really good at it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But it's harder to do all the technical things on these kind of pianos because um, the keys are not as light, you know, when you're pushing them oh, down. Right, right. They're kind of like really hard to push down because mm -hmm. these electronic instruments weren't designed for traditional classical music. They were designed for like those sustained tones like when you're doing those rock bands or mm -hmm. salsa music, right. like Celia Cruz and all that. And, <laughs> and, they, and they do something like, um, um, I don't know. You know, something mm -hmm. like that. But, uh, yes, have, have something to eat. <laughs> Would anybody like to join you? Thank you. I'm good. I just had a big omelet. If I start, I won't finish. So. <laughs> the, uh, did you ever play the band? Yes, sir, I did. Um, I when I was 26 years up, 26 years old at that time. Three years ago. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> when I was able to play a trumpet, still, I played with Pat Gittery and the High Rollers in Las Vegas. We, uh, we used to play at the um, Marina Hotel. I took a day job at the Tropicana, where at that time they had. Um, you know where they give out change for a yeah. dollar? I walked around that hotel all day long and at night I played at the marina, which was wow. next door. <laughs> and that's how I was able to sustain myself in Vegas at that time. Yeah. That was good work. Well, mm -hmm. I had to sustain myself as a showroom photographer oh. and uh, then cocktails and then I went back into teaching. Oh. But it was fun. It, it was a fun job. I bet. <laughs> yeah, it was fun playing in Vegas. I just didn't like the lifestyle as much. And I wrote about that in my autobiography too. But as far as the work, that was good. That was mm -hmm. fun. It was yeah. fun to walk on the strip when I wasn't working. It was fun to go to places like Circus Circus and eat the food and watch the animal shows, mm -hmm. or go to the Liberace Museum at the time. Mm -hmm. And because I think they've closed that museum now. I, but, uh, I think that was kind of cool. Too. His home? Well, no. The uh, way they had it set up, uh, the way the Liberace Museum was set up at that time, they had three warehouses because they had all the cars parked in there that he used to do on the shows and the oh. pianos. So it took these warehouses to get a tour of it. But was oh. that on Tropicana? Or yeah, that was on Tropicana when it was set up at that time. By his home on Shirley? Mm -hmm. Probably. I've never actually been to his home, but um, the museum was clo was there. Yeah. And yeah. It was he literally three warehouses. There. So three, yeah, it was three warehouses and they, and they um, oh, wow. and you know, it, what was interesting is when you went down the hallway, they had these little monitors where you could see different concerts throughout his career. And they always, of course, showed the ones with the water fountain water shooting up and stuff mm. like that since so it was Vegas, but uh, what a fantastic pianist that guy was. Yeah, he really was. Oh my goodness. And I think that the reason he was always criticized by the critics, I think they just couldn't get past the image. The well, there was... He was too flamboyant. Exactly. No but see, that's what made it fun. Yeah. No shortage of grandeur there, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, I realize that, but that's what made that show fun, mm -hmm. or, or just to watch him. Now, you know his black and white show? The, he had two shows in his career. I don't know if you knew that or not. Two television shows. Hmm. The first one, the black and white one, that he didn't have the rings and all that at the time. And according to history, that was the number one show on television beating I Love Lucy in 1952. Wow. According to history. Well, yeah. I used to tell people when I was a uh, photographer at the uh, at Caesars. Mm -hmm. Caesar, no, the Big Hilton. Hmm. The Big Hilton that men would go into those shows as if their wives were dragging them into the show in chains. Oh, and yeah. they'd come out singing and yeah. laughing and happy. So he did have magic. Yeah. 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 That was why Seymour uh, 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 Heller, I think it was his name, hired Liberace as a young man. Because he, he said in an interview he saw this charisma that this gifted pianist had. And uh, according to history, Bugsy Spiegel, the gangster, had his eye on Liberace. Oh, really? Yeah, according to history, he was going to try to hire Liberace uh, to play at the hotel that Bugsy had. Hmm. But he was he was gunned down before that actually happened. 
according to history. Didn't Bud C. Siegel have the flamingo? Yeah, yeah, and they saw this young Liberace and, and the gangster like, we got to get that piano player in here. <laughs> I don't even think he even liked piano. I just think he saw dollar signs. Right, right. But that never materialized. And uh, Seymour Heller went on to become Liberace's agent, and uh, the rest is history, according to you know, um, history there. So just a little historical fact about the life of Liberace there. <laughs> but um, you know, they also said that the men wanted to gamble, because you know, Vegas had that, I call it that Sinatra image at the time. You know, that hardcore drinking and gambling and listening to Dean Martin kind of stuff. They didn't want to hear no piano player at that time, so the ladies would go in there and, and play, uh, listen to the piano music, and the husbands would be out there playing cards and smoking and doing whatever at that time. But um, it worked. Yeah. At least for him it worked. Yeah. So it made him a millionaire. Yeah. But the television shows worked for him, too, mm -hmm. and the reason was because he came up in a time when television was new. Right. And... Um, they have this classical concert pianist on TV and mm -hmm. nobody else is doing it, your name's going to spread sure. out there. But he didn't just play classical. No, he oh, did he he all the popular, popular stuff yeah. and it worked. Yeah. So that was good marketing at mm -hmm. that time. That was in the day before rock and roll. Yeah, there was no rock and roll. No. Not yeah. in 1952. Yeah. It might have been just starting to surface. Starting. R&B was starting, but yeah. not on, in the it's public domain. Guy. Yeah. Well, let's have fun with some uh, R&B. Uh, let's try another song here. I'm, I'll just do a piece of it. Tell me if you've ever heard it. You don't hear like Bernadette on the piano every day, no way. painted black or <laughs> some of those other songs. Normally it's like I left my heart in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You want to tell that story again? <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't well, have to, but. There isn't much of a story because I was so intimidated I didn't do very well. Oh. And I hadn't been prepared for it because Anna Mani, Anna Connie, yeah. uh, lived at the residence where I lived. Mm -hmm. And she told me that she had a car she might be willing to sell me. And I was in the market for a car. Show you the car, and we'll see if you are interested in it. And instead, she drove me to this place at the corner of La Brea and Sunset. Mm -hmm. And we, it was called the Via Taxco. Mm -hmm. It was a restaurant, and, and we walked is. in, and there was this man in a white suit, in a white jacket, in a white vest, and a white hat with white gloves on. And he was sitting at a table, and he slowly took his gloves off, and she said, oh, you're going to audition. <laughs> and at the time, I was just doing operas and musicals. So I didn't have my music with me or anything, so I thought, well, I'll just take something that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, I'll come. I left my heart in San Francisco, and I didn't know who it was, because I did not watch Lawrence Welk. Sure, just sitting there. Yeah, you know, I, you get those opportunities that come once in a lifetime mm -hmm. and you're not prepared. I, yeah. I know what that's like. And, yeah. and uh, you think like, oh man, I wish I'd have been ready or uh -huh. something. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my moment came. Uh, and he was a really nice man, but I didn't know it with that image, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mine was, uh, I had to happen to me with Peggy Lee. Do you remember the, the big band singer of the 1940s? Well, she did a concert at the Music Circus in Sacramento 
and I was only a sophomore in high school at that time. I didn't know that lady from Adam then. And this really elegant lady walked up to me during the break of the show, just all by herself, no entourage or anything. And it was Peggy Lee, and I didn't know it was Peggy Lee at the time. And she was like, hi, young man, how are you? And I said, fine, ma'am, you know, you want to be polite. But she was like really elegant looking. And I, I, I don't know why the on switch didn't come on because I was, I was busy watching Harry James. I was uh -oh. thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about Peggy Lee. <laughs> she says, well, good evening, young man. I said, I'm a sophomore in high school. She asked my name, told her ASAP, and you know, that sort of thing. She talked to me for like 10 minutes, mm -hmm. just one on one. And then when she, she, before she left, she said, well, just finish your studies in school. Be a good little boy, you know, kind of <laughs> thing. I said, thank you, ma'am. So she left. I go back inside the uh, auditorium, and there all of a sudden, there she is on stage. Like, oh my goodness, that's that lady I just got to talking to. <laughs> and I didn't know it was Peggy Lee. If I had known that was her, I would say, can I have a job? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I told you this before, but I think I met her at a gas station in North Hollywood. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She had this uh, huge emerald green Cadillac. That sounds like something. You know, with all kinds of physical <laughs> equipment in it. Hmm. And she talked to me for, you know, like about 10 minutes about her musical things, but she didn't say who she was. Uh huh. And That's just kind of cool to keep a low profile, you know, they yeah. don't go like and advertising. And so I, you know, I didn't pick up on it. I just. <laughs> hmm. And the second time I met someone famous, my sister and I were in Vegas, and we we're just walking around the Riviera Hotel with Danny Thomas there. After the comedian walked in there, and my sister was staring, like, "What are you looking at?" <laughs> Just said, Look, that looks like Danny Thomas. Like, no, that's not him. What would he be doing here? That was my thinking. I almost walked away because I didn't think it was him. And she kept staring. So finally, she started walking toward him. I said, "Oh, I better go and follow her." Right. So, it turns out it really was Danny uh, Thomas. Uh, and you know, he uh, he had a club out on the Boulder Highway. Okay. See, I wasn't aware. Was I wasn't Danny's, aware. And he also was one of the contributors to Save Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. In, that, in, uh, uh, City. Yeah, that's pretty cool, that organization, that St. Jude's organization. They've been helping those children who are suffering over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't charge any money from what I understand. No, they don't. Now, when I met Mr. Thomas, we didn't talk about that aspect. You know what we talked about? Um, um, he had a television show called Make Room for Daddy. Do you remember that? Right, Bill he's Black still on it. MTV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, there was an episode where the trumpeter Harry James was on there, and Harry James was playing that Flight of the Bumblebee on the show. And somehow, we got to talking about his show. I said, well, Mr. Thomas, you know, I remember your show, and there was an episode where uh, you had that trumpeter Harry James on there playing Flight of the Bumblebee, and there was a lady with him. I guess she was like a business partner or something. And she looked at me and says, you still remember that episode? I said, yes, ma'am, I still do. <laughs> so we got to talk about Flight of the Bumblebee uh, for a little bit and Harry James, and then I did get to ask him for a job. But he told me that uh, they had what was called house bands that they were mm -hmm. just doing at that time, so they don't have people following the singers and the stars anymore like mm -hmm. they once did. Yeah, these studio musicians. Yeah, and yeah. all that. So that was kind of evolving from that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he we got to hang out with Mr. Thomas for a little bit, me and my sister, talked to him. He was very gracious, very, very gracious. Mm -hmm. He invited us up to his room later on that evening. They were going to have a little party, but we just declined. We <laughs> didn't want to, like, overkill. Oh, yeah. Well, you know how it I is. Know. I mean, he's yeah. probably going to be hobnobbing with a bunch of business, like, and I'm sitting up there wearing a pair of jeans or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, thank you. I, we just enjoyed our time that he gave us sure. at the hotel at that time. He gave us quite, a, quite some time. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it was fun talking about that television show. That was such a funny show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. It launched a lot of stars. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. Didn't that show launch off the Andy Griffith show, too, if I remember? Did Andy make it I, I don't think remember, it. actually. I think they had an episode where uh, a young Andy Griffith. Oh, I think he did go through Mayberry. Yeah. yeah. There was an episode where they went through the town of Mayberry. Yeah. Uh, and that launched off that series. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll launch out this series. <laughs> Hint. Yeah. You're pretty good so. at circling back to that. Case, yes, I, I know. I, I know. You're subtle. Yes, I know. Ain't I? <laughs> well, another person was Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, I never got to see him in concert. Never. I, I don't think I saw him in concert, but he was performing on the strip mm -hmm. when I was there as a camera.
love the candy man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he used to sing all the time. You and, know, um, I saw an uh, interview with him. He thought that was the silliest song. Oh, really? That he ever did. He <laughs> almost turned it down when oh, it was yeah? offered to him. Huh. Uh, for he, once in my life, and and what's that one from the box, the show about the boxer? Uh, if I can't be right, I can't be right for somebody else. If I'm not right for me. Hmm. I don't know. Once in my life? It might have been for once in my life. No, I don't think it does. You know, it's funny how, um, I don't know, I don't necessarily believe in fate, but how things work as far as, like, when we're talking about um, Sammy Davis Jr. and almost turning down the candy man. Well, that happened with uh, Bing Crosby and uh, the song, what's the song? Um, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Mm -hmm. You know that song that they play every year with mm -hmm. Gene Autry singing it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that song was originally offered to Bing Crosby, and he turned it down. Oh, really? And so when Mr. Crosby turned it down, it was offered to Gene Autry. Of course, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just makes you wonder what people think when they go, "Man, I could have sung that." <laughs> yeah, hindsight's hindsight's well, something. Yeah, it just makes you wonder. But uh, I did a story just on Bing Crosby just yesterday on Wake Up Missoula, and uh, you know they said he had a billion records wow. that he sold in his career. Not one million, but one billion wow. record sales. And he did so many radio shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking in the early People 30s, really too. Liked him. And I, I went through an era in the late 50s and early 60s where people just made fun of the singing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the crooner, mm -hmm. the scooper. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That was an enjoyable sound. And he, he really um, is one of the beginning forces in sounding more masculine instead of the yeah. high tenor sound. Mm -hmm. And not only that, um, they said that he came up in a time when the microphone was just kind of still new on the scene. So with that voice of his, you know, like you watch those old Bugs Bunny cartoons and you see that that uh, Bing Crosby uh, character mm -hmm. with the uh, Hawaiian shirt and a real thin Sinatra with a mic. They mm -hmm. came up around that time, so the cartoons just kind of worked that and well, capitalized on it. But the Sinatra really admired Bing Crosby, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's why he focused on becoming a baritone. Mm -hmm. And also, I did a, contra a contrast between Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra, so it, it's on yesterday's Wake Up Missoula program. Mm -hmm. There's this contrast. It's, it's posted. Back Good. Up. I will Scott Ramp, check it out. Yeah, Scott mm -hmm. Ramp uh, posted it, and he's, he's the host of the uh, Wake Up Missoula, so we did that yesterday. You guys are up too early for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. What time is that? That comes, well, it airs, I think, 8 o'clock our time in the morning. But everybody's there way before 8, obviously, yeah. setting up and whatever. Sure. So, uh, Noel McBoy and Scott Ramp, they're the host of Wake Up Missoula. So, I did this contrast yesterday on Crosby and Sinatra. And, you know, they were friends in real life, but the, I guess the media, maybe the cartoons were always uh, making those comparisons between mm -hmm. those two. Making them rivals. Yeah, yeah. when they really weren't. They yeah. were just great singers. <laughs> So. Yeah, Sinatra's timing was fantastic. Yeah. That's what I liked about him the most. You know, um... And he used to really emphasize praise. Mm -hmm. You know, I had read about Sinatra that, you know, when he was a young man, when he had that phenomenal breath control, he literally would swim under the water to develop his lungs. Mm -hmm. And it shows because when you look at the film, um, what's the name of that film? Till the Clouds Roll. Have mm -hmm. you ever seen that movie? Till the, till the Clouds, clouds Roll, roll by. by. Oh, till the, I'm sorry, Till the Clouds mm -hmm. Roll By. There's a young Frank Sinatra singing Old Man River mm. at the end of that. And he holds this note at the end of that that's like, oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, you should see that. Yeah, I think that was Sinatra at his best during those crooner years, in my opinion. I know everybody thinks the capital years with the swing music, mm -hmm. with the hat. Right. And he was good at that. He was great at that, actually, you know. And I, I'll get by, he really just uh, redid. I remember that name. Same on a piano, but short version of Old Man River. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So, Mayor, um, let's see, you once said you played a trumpet when you were younger? After a fashion, yeah. <laughs> not, in a, not in a way that anyone would necessarily recognize it. Did you uh, <laughs> take band classes? I or? did indeed, yeah. So I, I began playing uh, trumpet in the, uh, I want to say, fifth or sixth grade. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, of course, um, begged my parents for the chance to play the trumpet and then later begged my parents to stop playing the trumpet. <laughs> one of those sort of... How many yeah. years did you play the trumpet? Uh, you know, I think I gave it up in eighth grade. Mm. Oh, after, okay, childhood, okay. After considerable yeah, heartache on everyone's part. So, yeah, well, I bet like, you were a football player. We gave it. Nah, you know, I wasn't. I, I had a, I had a coach once who told me I ran too long in the same place. <laughs> I, was, yeah, I was large. I was large, but I lacked talent. Oh, and that was, uh, yeah. Well, don't feel bad. I wasn't exactly Miles Davis or Louis Armstrong myself on a trumpet. I could just play well enough to skirt on some songs. That's well, about it. No, I you know, I couldn't cut loose like Dizzy Gillespie and all that, and I couldn't scream the high notes like uh, Maynard Ferguson or somebody. <laughs> yeah. No, I got left out in that department. Well, I, I certainly had classmates who were talented. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a funny story you might like. Uh, we had this uh, Hispanic kid in our band class, his name was Caesar, and he could scream these really high notes and stay up there. On the trumpet. Yeah, on the trumpet. <laughs> and. Um, we were doing a graduation ceremony for uh, the seniors that were graduating that year, and the band teacher looked at Caesar and goes, Caesar, I don't want you to hit that high note. And I said, he's going to hit that high note. <laughs> More or less an invitation to hit the mm -hmm. high note. Yeah, and Absolutely. so what happened was the seniors started marching out, and he looked all great. It was because we came from big high schools, like 500 students maybe, something like that. And um, we're doing that. Pop and circumstance intro, like sort of thing. And when we got to that end, Caesar went way up into the stratosphere, <laughs> and he stayed up there, and he played this note loud on purpose. And I think he just wanted to get back at the band teacher. And so you know, you couldn't stop. The band teacher's going like this, and he had this look like, "I'm going to kill that yeah, kid no kidding. when this is over." <laughs> and then I'll hand him to his parents after that. So the, the band teacher was going like this, and couldn't stop it. Oh. I mean, he exceptionally yeah. hit this high note. Was it in key? It was in key. He did it on purpose. So, I mean, I couldn't tell you the name of the note or anything. Like, it was just this really outrageous high note. I know it was past the high C on the trump, but I wow. tell you that. He screamed way up there. Jeez. What key is pop in circumstances? It's in G. It goes something like this. Classical version, obviously, you got the little fanfare going on, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But um, yeah, that's what Caesar did. He screamed the high heaven and stayed up there. And <laughs> so, did he ever achieve a career as a player? I don't know. Once you graduate, you lose contact with mm -hmm. so many students. There's no way to know. But this kid was talented. He, in fact, a lot of the Hispanic kids could scream high notes at the high school I went to, and they just, they just did. Well, it's part of the culture. Yeah. You know, yeah, the mariachi bands. And, mm -hmm. you know, That's all. probably why they were able to do that. Yeah. Now, I did get an opportunity to sit in with a famous salsa singer once. Yeah. A singer named Johnny Nelson. I don't know if you mm. know him. African-American Cuban singer. Mm. And uh, they uh, didn't have hardly anyone in that band that night. I think they were just traveling through, and they stopped at this one place where I was invited mm. one night. And he just said, hey, we need a musician. Want to play? I said, sure. <laughs> I had a trumpet. They had a trumpet there. Uh -huh. I picked it up and got to fake my way through <laughs> with Johnny Nelson for that night. I love salsa music. It's well, I didn't the scream the high heaven no, like they no. normally do, but <laughs> I was able to do enough notes to satisfy just that moment because mm -hmm. I think they were just passing through. They weren't like prepared. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any Paul Simon in your repertoire? Yeah, and uh, we can end this show because it's almost an hour now. I thought time flies. Yeah.
speaking thank of, you, uh, thank you. Uh, speaking of Paul Simon, did you see the movie The Graduate? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a movie, yeah. Huh? I will say that for another time. But uh, they have some pretty cool uh, music in that film, mm -hmm. and that's what made Dustin Hoffman famous. Mm -hmm. I saw him on a show called The Naked City. It was a detective show. Oh yeah. Uh, when so he must have been like maybe a teenager. Oh. Oh. He was just a total unknown. Mm -hmm. Man, he was young. <laughs> I mean, you think he was young in a graduate. Now imagine, what, 10 years younger? Yeah. But he, he usually, he generally looked younger than he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's quite the actor. I liked him in Rain Man, too. <laughs> and Rain Man was the, the best, that I think it was his best. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on that note, let's make some final acknowledgments because, uh, you know, time just flies by when you're doing this show. And again, once again, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Honorable Mayor John Ingen on our program. Linda Brooks Curtis, thank you for being part of this. And Mayor, thank you for taking time to My celebrate thank you. 50th ASAP Cafe. And you too, Luis Bundy, thank you. And I am your host, ASAP Adonai. And uh, any final words before we sign on? Happy trail. I <laughs> <laughs> too. That's a good start. There you go. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for celebrating our 50th show. Until our next show, Maranatha. 54.